You're watching Phantom Astronauts Nocturnal Tales. Tonight, we delve deep into the chilling world of demonic possession, where the line between sanity and the supernatural fades, and the darkness claims more than just your soul. These stories are real. They've been whispered about for centuries, and have sent shivers down the spines of anyone brave enough to listen. But before we begin, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to check the links in the description for more ways to show your support. Now, dim the lights, settle in, and prepare yourself. These are the 20 scariest real accounts of demonic possession. Annalisa Michelle sat at the dining room table, her once bright, innocent eyes now hollowed by years of torment. The church had long been involved in her case. No one could deny that Annalisa had once been a devout Catholic girl, full of life and laughter. But over the years, she had changed. Her family claimed it started with small things. A voice, an eerie feeling in her presence. But soon she began speaking in tongues, languages she had never learned, growling with an unnatural ferocity. At night, she would convulse violently, her body twisting in ways that seemed inhuman. Father Ernst Alt and Father Arnold Renz had been called to help, and they had performed numerous exorcisms over the course of the next year. But nothing seemed to help. Instead, the demon, or demons, inside her grew more aggressive. During one particularly grueling session, Annalise's voice lowered to a growl that sounded nothing like her. It was guttural, animalistic. I am Judas, the voice hissed. I am Lucifer. Father Alt recoiled slightly, his rosary clutched in his trembling hands. He could feel the weight of the entity in the room, the stench of sulfur thickening the air. Why have you come to torment her? Father Alt demanded, his voice steady, but edged with desperation. Annalisa, or whatever had taken control of her, smirked. She is mine. For hours, the exorcism continued, the room filling with prayers and screams. Her body contorted unnaturally, her limbs flailing against invisible restraints. When it was over, Annalisa lay limp, her breath ragged. Please, she whispered to her parents, her voice now her own. I just want to die. In the end, she would pass away, her body too weak to fight anymore. And though the church had sanctioned her exorcisms, they were never able to explain what truly happened to Annalisa Michelle. Was it epilepsy? Psychosis? Or had something far darker claimed her soul? Two, the possession of Maurice Theriot. Maurice Theriot was a farmer in Massachusetts, a man built from hard work and routine. But by the late 1980s, uh, his life had spiraled into something unrecognizable. His wife, Nancy, had begun to notice strange behaviors, objects moving on their own, his mood shifting dramatically as if he were two different people. Maurice's personality would snap between gentle and violent without warning. He would stare into the distance, eyes blank, as though he were no longer there. Maurice had grown up in a troubled household, his father a tyrant who beat him mercilessly. Many believed the darkness in Maurice's soul had begun to fester in those early years, but now something else had taken hold. It was during a church service that things escalated. As the priest began reading from the Bible, Maurice collapsed in a fit. 
His body writhed on the ground, but his eyes, those glassy, dead eyes, never blinked. He began to speak, though not with his own voice. The words were guttural, sharp, and foreign. I am the one who has come, he hissed through clenched teeth. His voice dripped with malevolence. Lorraine and Ed, Warren, famous paranormal investigators, were called to the Theriol farmhouse. Lorraine, a clairvoyant, immediately sensed the dark energy surrounding Maurice. It was overwhelming, oppressive. There's something inside him, she said softly, crossing herself. Something old. They arranged for an exorcism, but the demon fought back with ferocity. Maurice's skin would split open without warning, blood pouring from invisible wounds. At one point, he levitated off the ground, eyes rolling back into his head. His face distorted, morphing into something ancient and unrecognizable. For hours, the priests fought against the entity, invoking prayers, casting holy water. Maurice howled in pain, the demon refusing to release its grip. But in the end, the exorcism seemed to work, at least for a time. Maurice would later take his own life, unable to cope with the memories and the scars left behind by the possession. To this day, his case remains one of the most terrifying accounts of demonic possession in American history. Three, Michael Taylor, the Osset, murder case. The sleepy town of Osset, England, was not a place one would expect to find the devil lurking. But in 1974, Michael Taylor's quiet life was ripped apart by something far beyond reason. It started innocently enough. Taylor, a husband and father, had been struggling with depression. A local Christian group led by a charismatic young woman named Marie Robinson offered him comfort. But as Taylor became more involved, his behavior shifted dramatically. He began showing an unhealthy attachment to Marie, his mood swinging wildly between euphoria and rage. One night, during a prayer meeting, Taylor began convulsing, screaming profanities. He lashed out violently, attacking Marie and others in the room. The group tried to calm him, but something sinister had taken hold. His eyes were wild, his voice dripping with venom as he spat out blasphemies. The local church, sensing the dark presence, called in an exorcist. Over the next several days, Taylor endured a brutal exorcism, the priests desperately trying to rid him of the entity. His body thrashed, and he screamed that he could feel the devil inside him. The exorcists claimed they expelled dozens of demons, lust, anger, murder, but one remained, the demon of madness. After the exorcism, Taylor returned home, but whatever remained within him was not done. That night, in a fit of rage, he brutally murdered his wife. Her body was found mutilated, her face torn apart with Michael's bare hands. When the police arrived, they found Taylor, naked, covered in blood, wandering the streets, babbling incoherently. He had no memory of the murder, only the lingering feeling that something evil had driven him to the unspeakable act. 4. The Haunting of Clara Germana Selle in 1906, a 16-year-old orphan named Clara Germana Sell lived at St. Michael's Mission in Natal, South Africa. Raised in the strict and pious environment of the Catholic orphanage, Clara had always been devout, until one fateful day 
when she claimed to have made a pact with the devil. It started with strange behavior. The nuns who watched over her noticed Clara speaking in languages she had never been taught, her voice deep and unnatural. She became violent, attacking the other girls and the priests, throwing them across the room with strength that no teenager should possess. The nuns reported that Clara's body would levitate during prayers, her eyes glowing with an unnatural light. Her voice would shift, sometimes several tones lower, speaking in languages like Polish, German, and French. Even though Clara had never left South Africa, Father Herner and Father Erasmus were called to perform the exorcism. For two days, they battled the entity inside her, praying over her thrashing, screaming body. At one point, the demon within Clara taunted them, mocking their faith and threatening to possess others in the church. Her body twisted and contorted in impossible ways, and she growled, I am Satan himself. The priests continued their prayers, despite the overwhelming dread that filled the room. By the second day, Clara's screams became animalistic, and her face took on a distorted, monstrous appearance. But as they pressed on, the entity finally left. Clara collapsed, her body spent, her face reverting to its normal state. She was free for now. Five. David Glatzel. The devil made me do it. In 1980, a young boy named David Glatzel was at the center of one of the most infamous possession cases in American history. The Glatzel family had recently moved into a new home in Brookfield, Connecticut. And almost immediately, David began complaining about a terrifying old man who appeared to him in his dreams. Soon, those dreams began to bleed into reality. David's behavior changed. He became aggressive, violent, and began speaking in deep, unnatural voices. His family, terrified, reached out to Ed and Lorraine Warren, who quickly determined that David was under the influence of a powerful demonic entity. The Warrens arranged for a series of exorcisms during which David's body convulsed violently. He would scream blasphemies in a voice that wasn't his own, his eyes rolling back into his head. The demon within him threatened to kill everyone in the room, laughing as David's body was thrown against the walls. As the exorcisms continued, the Warrens believed they had driven the demon out, only for it to attach itself to a new host, a family friend named Arnie Johnson. What happened next would become known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. Johnson, under the influence of the entity, would later murder his landlord in a brutal, frenzied attack. At his trial, he claimed that the devil had made him commit the crime. The court rejected the plea, but the Glatzel family and the Warrens stood by their belief that the demon had indeed taken control of Arnie Johnson. Six, the Smurl family, haunting. In the 1980s, Jack and Janet Smurl thought they had found the perfect home for their growing family in West Pittston, Pennsylvania. But soon after moving in, the Smurls were tormented by something dark and unexplainable. The family began hearing loud, unexplained noises, voices whispering in the dead of night, furniture moving on its own. Janet reported seeing a dark, shadowy figure lurking in the corners of rooms. As the months passed, the entity 
grew more aggressive. Jack was attacked by unseen forces, claw marks appearing on his back without explanation. The Smurls called in Ed and Lorraine Warren, who believed the family was dealing with a powerful demonic presence. The Warrens performed several exorcisms, but each time, the demon seemed to return stronger. The Smurl family's torment lasted for years, and though they eventually moved, the question remains, did they leave the demon behind, or did it follow them? Seven, the exorcism of Robbie Mannheim, the real story behind the exorcist. In 1949, a young boy known as Robbie Mannheim, though his real name was kept secret for privacy reasons, became the subject of one of the most famous exorcism cases in American history. His story would later inspire the film The Exorcist. Robbie had been particularly close to his aunt, who had recently passed away. After her death, strange things began happening in the family home. Objects moving on their own, strange sounds echoing through the house. Robbie became withdrawn, his behavior increasingly erratic. The family, desperate for help, contacted a local priest. When the boy began speaking in Latin, a language he had never learned, the priest realized they were dealing with something far beyond the realm of psychology. The exorcism was brutal. Robbie screamed, writhed, and spat at the priests. His body twisted in unnatural ways, and the bed beneath him shook violently. At one point, the words hell and evil appeared scratched into his skin. After weeks of intense battle, the demon was finally expelled. Robbie would go on to live a normal life, but those who witnessed the exorcism would never forget the horror they had seen. Eight, the possession of Julia. In the 2000s, Dr. Richard Gallagher, a psychiatrist and professor of clinical psychiatry, came face to face with a case that would challenge everything he knew about the human mind. Julia, a woman who had been involved in a satanic cult, came to him claiming she was possessed by demons. Julia's case was unlike anything Dr. Gallagher had ever encountered. She would go into trances, during which her voice would change dramatically, sometimes to that of a man, sometimes to multiple voices speaking at once. Objects around her would move on their own, and she would reveal knowledge about people and events she couldn't possibly know. During one exorcism, Julia levitated off the ground, her body stiff as a board, her eyes rolling back into her head. The room filled with an oppressive, suffocating presence, as though the very air had turned dark. Despite the exorcisms, the demon refused to leave. Julia's possession would continue for years, and to this day, Dr. Gallagher remains convinced that what he witnessed was a genuine case of demonic possession. Nine, the Ammons family, haunting. In 2011, Latoya Ammons and her three children moved into a rental home in Gary, Indiana. Almost immediately, strange things began happening. Swarms of flies gathered on the porch and footsteps could be heard echoing through the house when no one was there. Latoya's children began to exhibit disturbing behavior. One of her sons would growl and speak in deep, unnatural voices, as though someone or something was speaking through him. Another of her children levitated above his bed, eyes wide in terror as invisible hands seemed to hold him in place. 
The family sought help from doctors, priests, and even the police, but the occurrences continued. During one visit to the hospital, a nurse witnessed one of Latoya's sons walking backward up a wall, defying gravity, before dropping to the floor, as if nothing had happened. Father Michael Maginot, a local priest, was called to the house to investigate. He performed several blessings, but it soon became clear that something far darker was at play. Father Maginot requested permission from the diocese to perform an exorcism on the house and the family. Over the next few months, Father Maginot performed multiple exorcisms on Latoya and her children, during which they screamed, convulsed, and spoke in languages they didn't know. The house itself seemed to react violently, lights flickering, objects moving, and doors slamming on their own. Eventually, the family fled the home, and the haunting seemed to cease. But the events that took place there left a permanent scar on all involved. And, to this day, the Ammons case is considered one of the most well-documented cases of possession in modern history. 10. The Possession of Roland Doe. In the late 1940s in suburban Maryland, a young boy known only as Roland Doe, a pseudonym, became the subject of one of the most infamous exorcism cases in history, an event that would later inspire the iconic novel and film, The Exorcist. Roland was a quiet, introverted boy who had recently lost his beloved Aunt Harriet, a spiritualist who had introduced him to the occult. After her death, strange occurrences began to plague the family home. Objects would move by themselves, and unexplainable noises filled the house. At night, Roland would wake up to the feeling of something crawling across his bed, unseen hands grabbing at him in the dark. His family sought help from the church, and soon a team of priests, led by Father William Bodern, was brought in to perform an exorcism. The ritual was long and grueling, lasting for weeks. During the exorcism, Roland would thrash violently, his body contorting as though it were no longer his own. His voice would shift, becoming deep and guttural, and the priests claimed that he spoke in ancient tongues. At one point, the word hell appeared scratched into Roland's skin, seemingly by an unseen force. Furniture in the room would shake and tip over, and the temperature would drop dramatically. The priests fought tirelessly, reciting prayers and casting holy water, their faith tested by the overwhelming evil that filled the room. Finally, after days of struggle, Roland let out a blood-curdling scream and the entity was expelled. He collapsed, exhausted. His body returned to normal. Roland went on to live a quiet, uneventful life, but those who witnessed the exorcism were forever haunted by what they had seen. Eleven. The Possession of Elizabeth Knapp. In 1671, in the small Puritan town of Groton, Massachusetts, Elizabeth Knapp, a servant in the household of Reverend Samuel Willard, became the center of a terrifying possession. The case remains one of the earliest documented instances of demonic possession in American history. Elizabeth had been acting strangely for weeks, complaining of mysterious pains in her body and hearing voices that no one else could hear. But soon, her behavior became more alarming. She began speaking in strange, guttural tones, her voice shifting from her normal soft tone to something far more sinister. She would convulse, her body racked with violent spasms, and claim that the devil 
had made a pact with her. Reverend Willard began recording the events as they unfolded, documenting the strange voices that spoke through Elizabeth, the blasphemy she uttered, and the unnatural strength she displayed during her fits. At times, she would throw herself to the ground, clawing at her skin and screaming that the devil was inside her, tormenting her soul. Willard and the townspeople prayed for her, hoping to drive out the evil that had taken root. Elizabeth claimed that Satan had offered her riches and power in exchange for her soul, and though she resisted, the entity continued to torment her. The possession lasted for weeks, with Elizabeth's fits becoming more violent and erratic. Eventually, after intense prayer sessions, the entity seemed to lose its hold on her. Elizabeth was freed from the possession, but her life was never the same. The town of Groton remained haunted by the memory of the evil that had passed through their midst. 12. The Possession of George Lukens. In 1778, in the quiet village of Yatton, England, a man named George Lukens shocked the world with his claims of being possessed by demons. Lukens, a tailor by trade, had been suffering from strange fits and convulsions for years. He would bark like a dog, sing in strange voices, and speak in languages he had never learned. The local church, alarmed by his behavior, decided to perform an exorcism. A group of seven priests gathered in the church to rid George of the demons that had taken hold of him. During the exorcism, George's body twisted and contorted, his voice changing from a deep growl to a high-pitched scream. He claimed that he was possessed by seven demons and that they would not leave him without a fight. The priests, undeterred, continued their prayers, casting holy water and invoking the name of Christ. For hours, George writhed on the ground, screaming in pain as the demons fought to maintain control. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, George let out a piercing scream and his body went limp. The priests declared that the demons had been expelled. George Lukens returned to his normal life, but the case left a lasting impression on the village and the church. It remains one of the most well-known cases of possession in England. 13. The Possession of Martha Brossier. In 1578, Martha Brossier, a young woman from the small town of Romorantin, France, claimed to be possessed by demons. Her case became famous throughout the country, drawing the attention of both the church and the public. Martha's possession was marked by violent convulsions, speaking in tongues, and fits of blasphemy. She would scream and writhe on the floor, her body contorting in unnatural ways. Witnesses claimed that her voice would change, becoming deep and malevolent, as though a man were speaking through her. The local clergy attempted several exorcisms, but the demon within Martha proved resilient. During the rituals, her body would levitate off the ground and objects around her would move on their own. The priests were baffled by the sheer power of the entity that had taken control of her. After months of failed exorcisms, Martha's case was brought before the Catholic Church in Paris. A team of priests and doctors examined her, and while some believed her to be possessed, others thought she was suffering from a mental illness. In the end, the church declared that there was no evidence of demonic possession, though many continued to believe 
that Martha had been the victim of something far darker than science could explain. Down. 14. The Possession of Michael Jones Michael Jones was a young man from the rural town of Didisham, England, in the early 1800s. Raised in a religious household, Michael had always been a devout Christian, but something changed when he turned 18. He began experiencing strange visions, dark, malevolent figures watching him from the corners of his room, whispering things he didn't understand. Soon, Michael's behavior became erratic. He would lash out violently at his family, his eyes wild with fear and rage. He claimed that something was inside him, controlling his thoughts and actions. His family, terrified, sought the help of the local priest, who quickly realized that Michael was possessed. The exorcism took place in the local church, where Michael was restrained by several men as the priest began his prayers. Michael's body convulsed violently, his face twisted in agony. He screamed that the devil was inside him laughing at their attempts to save him. For hours, the priest continued his prayers, his voice growing hoarse as the entity fought back. Finally, with a final scream, Michael collapsed, his body still and quiet. The demon was gone. Michael would never speak of the possession again, but those who witnessed the exorcism would never forget the terror that had filled the church that day. Now, Perchance. 15. The Possession of Anna Eklund. In 1928, in the small town of Erling, Iowa, a woman named Anna Eklund became the subject of one of the most famous exorcism cases in American history. Anna had been raised in a strict Catholic household, but by the time she reached adulthood, she began to experience strange and terrifying symptoms. She claimed to be tormented by voices that urged her to commit blasphemous acts, and her behavior became increasingly erratic. She would hiss and growl at those around her, speaking in voices that were not her own. Father Theophilus Riesinger, a German priest with experience in exorcisms, was called to help. The exorcism took place over several weeks, during which Anna's body contorted violently, and she spoke in multiple languages, some of which were ancient and unknown to her. At one point, Anna's body levitated off the bed, her eyes rolling back into her head. She screamed that the demons inside her would never leave, that they had claimed her soul. But Father Riesinger persisted and after days of intense prayer, the demon was expelled. Anna Eklund's case remains one of the most documented and terrifying instances of possession in history. Thank you for watching these chilling tales of real life possession. If you enjoyed tonight's episode of Phantom Astronauts Nocturnal Tales, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to help our channel grow. You can also check the links in the description to find more ways to show your support. This has been Phantom Astronauts Nocturnal Tales, and I will see you out there.